Homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about essentially the great apostasy, but how I think the uh, concept of the great apostasy uh, is lost on many Latter-day Saints when they think about the Antichrist, okay? This idea of a singular one person Antichrist that's prophesied in the last days. What I think happens, okay, because I've been doing this for a little while now, I've been doing a lot of in-depth study, and this seems to be where we have the breakdown, is the apostasy, the great apostasy, and how that fits in to all this. And I'm going to show you what I mean in just a minute, okay? So, Christians, not of our faith, okay, just other Christians outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they read scriptures that they interpret to be um, a singular one-person Antichrist that's supposed to come in the last days. Here's just like a simple um, timeline that somebody put together, and as you can see here, it's talking about, oh, the Antichrist is revealed, and then after that, the Antichrist is destroyed, and then the millennium. And there's many, 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 many different variations of this, um, different configurations, everyone trying to figure it out, okay? Now, the thing that I want to point out is right here. You see this box right here? Okay, it says, you are here, and then it says, church age. This is where the confusion comes in. As Latter-day Saints try and um, understand the last days and they're trying to understand the scriptures, uh, they wander off and listen to other you know, YouTube channels or read books or whatever the case may be, and they get the perspective of these people here that <clears throat> call this right here the church age, where we call it the great apostasy which is a, a fundamental difference between us and the rest of Christianity. It's a, it's a fundamental difference, okay? So you'll have to understand that and think about that as we talk about the quote-unquote Antichrist. And um, I've said before many times, I don't accept this notion of a one-person Antichrist that is prophesied, and we know that <clears throat> the second coming isn't close because we haven't seen the Antichrist yet. I reject that idea. Uh, the church does believe in Antichrists, plural, meaning people that are contrary to Christ, um, that actively oppose him. You know, we have examples of Antichrists in the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> okay? Uh, we also have the concept of a great and abominable church, okay? But it's not called the Antichrist. It is an Antichrist power, okay? But the idea that we are not close to the second coming because we have not seen the Antichrist yet, I feel, is flawed. And it comes from these other denominations, especially the evangelicals. They, they are all on top of this. You go to... Other YouTube channels, very good people, because I watch them, okay? But they don't have this funda fundamental understanding that we do, right? They have a different view of what happened after Christ was crucified and what happened to the church. So that's going to come into play. That's going to come into play. So you have um, two <clears throat> main places where the idea of Antichrist comes from, along with a couple others. Uh, you have the book of Revelation, and then you have the book of Daniel. Those are like the two big um, books of scripture that are cited um, to, to prove the existence of an Antichrist of the last days. Okay, and We're going to talk about both of these. Now, there is there are other references, uh, for example, here in Second Thessalonians, and uh, I'm going to kind of start off with this. Okay, uh, I'm just going to show you this as an example, and then we're going to run through the whole thing. Okay, so verse this is Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses three and four to start out with, and it says, "Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and 
<clears throat> that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so you're an evangelical, you're reading this, and you're like, oh, okay, <clears throat> the man of sin has to be revealed in the last days. This is talking about the last days, Acor according to them, right? Okay, let's move on. Um, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right, and then, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with that, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's go over here. This is a BYU. Uh, this is from the Scholars Archive with BYU. And let's understand what Revelation is about, the book of Revelation, and the, the epistle <clears throat> uh, Thessalonians, the, the two epistles of Thess Thessalonians. I'm going to read this section of this, um, this article here, okay? Consideration one, why John wrote Revelation. <clears throat> Let's zoom in. Okay, understanding why John wrote Revelation helps both teacher and student understand the major message of the book. The seer wrote with a definite objective in mind. It was to fulfill the commandment given him directly by Jesus Christ on an unforgettable Sabbath sometime during the last decade of the first century. However, that was not the only reason he wrote. <clears throat> he was living when many of the saints were discouraged, even frightened. They were in the midst of the greatest crisis yet faced by the early church. The ordeal through which they were passing had terrifying prospects. Rome, the seemingly omnipotent master of, of their world, had determined that holding to the Christian faith constituted a crime worthy of death. The Asian churches already knew the effect of that brutal decision. Uh, for example, see Revelation 2.13, and many wondered how a few powerless Christians could survive against the Roman Colossus. As bad as the, the external danger to the fledgling church was, there was a greater in internal danger, apostasy. Those with eyes to see knew that after half a century of struggling, apostasy was gaining the upper hand. The Savior's apostles and prophets knew it was coming. It was one of the themes on which the Lord had dwelt during his 40-day ministry after his resurrection. See Acts chapter 1 verse 3. From the days of that ministry, the shadow of the Antichrist haunted the peace of the saints. Paul warned the Thessalonians. Okay, so Paul, he was writing to the Thessalonians to warn them. Paul warned the, Th the Thessalonians, the Miletians, or Miletians, Miletians, and others that, uh, quote unquote, falling away would occur because men would not endure sound doctrine. Okay, so, so look, this is where, this is where the great apostasy comes into play. Other Christians do not have an understanding that that's what happened, that the church that Christ originally set up was lost. There was a falling away, a falling away before the second coming, which would be about 2,000 years later or more. So <clears throat> this has to do, okay, because here's like another kind of fundamental error I think we make when we read some scriptures. The Book of Mormon was written specifically for us right? But the rest of scripture, not necessarily. It's for us. We can uh, learn things from it. Very important things. But, for example, this letter to the Thessalonians, it wasn't for us, per se. It was for the Thessalonians, right? Paul, the apostle, was warning them about what was going to happen. So, we can benefit from it because we can look back in hindsight and uh, see what happened. But sometimes we go a little bit too far with applying the scriptures to us, meaning that some people apply everything in the scripture as though it ta it's talking about the last days. And that's not true. In Thessalonians, it's talking about the time um, 
at the at the beginning of Christ Church, like the early days and before it's lost. <clears throat> That's it's not written about the last days. Okay, so Christians they look at it and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, this is talking about the last days and uh, the man of sin is going to make his appearance and he's going to sit on the throne of God. Uh, that's when the, you know, the Jews are going to build the third temple and it's probably going to be by the Antichrist and he's going to sit in the temple and uh, declare himself to be God. No, 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 no. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians warning them about the imminent apostasy of the church. But l let's continue, okay? Okay, let's continue. Um, also, quote, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. That's from Acts 20, verse 30. As a result of this falling away, the, <clears throat> uh, quote, unquote, that man of sin, a son of perdition, would be revealed. Quote, who opposeth and exalteth, exalteth himself above, above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple, meaning that is the church. Okay, so that's another thing right there. It, it's imagery, it's symbolism, it, sometimes it's not literal, right? So, <clears throat> because the, the church... The church is the body of Christ. The, our bodies are a temple. We are the temple. We make up the temple. You know what I'm saying? That's basically what this is talking about. Whoso opposeth and exalteth himself up uh, above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, that is the church of God, showing himself that he is God. So people that are just running amok with the doctrines of the church, some maybe that maybe have certain agendas that go against the church. They're not concerned about truth. They're more concerned about uh, politics or their standing in the community or whatever the case may be. They have their own agenda. The Greek word that Paul used was apostasia, which is translated in the King James Version as, quote unquote, falling away. It meant literally, quote, to stand apart in immovable opposition, end quote, and in a civil sense to rebel, or better, to mutiny. Okay, so not just a falling away, but a rebellion, a mutiny, uh, to stand apart in an immovable opposition. Okay, so falling away, maybe, maybe with what he's saying here, maybe that's not the best translation. It carried the idea of an internal takeover by parties hostile to the established authority, leadership, and constitution. Paul warned the church for over three years that there would be such a rebellion. See Acts 20.31. Though the leaders whom the Savior had chosen were once successful, they would be replaced by others of a perverse nature, wolves in sheep's clothing, who would change the doctrine or constitution, of Christ to fit their own philosophical understanding. Paul's warning shows that the church was not uh, in danger of totally disappearing. Rather, those antichrists... So again, think about, think about the Book of Mormon and think about people like Nahor, that <clears throat> they had some kind of philosophy. They still kind of... You know, there would be those that be that would claim that they saw an angel, and an angel told them to do to do this, or they'd have some kind of philosophy like, "Oh, hey, don't don't worry about anything. Uh, God justifies you in everything that you do. He he loves you so much that you can do whatever you want, and and you're good." Th that kind of thing. That's an antichrist. So th that same phenomena that was happening there um, after after Christ's death. Uh, that same phenomena was present. There were antichrists. Anyway, rather, those antichrists who would replace Christ's gospel with the doctrines of men mingled with scripture would assume control. Even so, Christiani Christianity would continue, albeit in attenuated and distorted forms. At the, re at the time... At the time John wrote Revelation, a power struggle raged within, within the Christian community. John wrote his work for those who yet clung to the truth. He warned against false prophets in their source of, imp of inspiration and emphasized that God would not allow them to continue without consequence. 
if the churches chose to reject God's officers, he would come out in judgment by ad abandoning the churches and allowing the false leaders to take over. Okay, so this is talking about the early church. It's not talking about the last days. It's talking about these antichrist weirdos that would come in and try and, um, you know, co-opt the church, essentially. Um, eventually, the apostate church would be consumed and disappear under a blaze of truth and light associated with the coming of Christ. Um, but what of that nation that was the political seed of persecution, whose authority even the least of the Christians feared? The Revelator had an answer. God would move against Rome and every other uh, recreant nation that followed. His authority would prevail over even these seemingly omnipotent masters. And the powers of hell, which undergirded and supported these corrupt governments and institutions, and from which they drew both their strength and inspiration, would also incur the terrible wrath of God. Driven into war, lust, <clears throat> they would fight against themselves until the time of God would intervene and stop all fighting and render them eternally impotent. Thus, the focus of Revelation, the core around which everything revolves, is the issue of authority. Who really controls the world? Uh, is it the political institutions, the powers of evil, or God? To the faithful few, struggling against external pressure and growing persecutions and being buffeted by the alternative voices of the apostates, the message of Revelation with its Sorry, got to scroll onto the next page. With its omnipotent and avenging yet caring God, must have thought must have brought comfort and hope with its promise of final victory. Okay, so let's go back and let's look at this uh, timeline here. Again, uh, a Christian, if they um, evangelical Baptist, whoever, if they came here and they watched this, they would look at this timeline and be like, no, no, that's not true. That didn't happen. The church continued, um, and then over time it got corrupted, and so there was an, a necessity for the Reformation. But you know, we've had the church, we've had the basics ever since the time of Christ, and uh, it's had to be be refined. You know, they they realized that things weren't right um, when the church was kind of uh, all. I mean, you had you had the Catholic Church, but but you also had the Orthodox churches, and those went for a long time, but. Um, you know, the big one. The big one was the Catholic Church. And again, this isn't against Catholics. My Half of my family, my mom's side of the family, they're all Catholic. They're in Portugal, in Europe, and they're Catholic. So I don't hate my family, but the truth is the truth, okay? And <clears throat> this, was, this was basically the church that um, won in the competition of different Christian sects and creeds, uh, in that same mix, you had the Gnostics that had a bunch of weirdo ideas, and um, they never really formed a church. It was mostly just a collection of these weird ideas um, that are actually kind of bad and anti-Christ in themselves, uh, if you know about Gnosticism. But um, anyway, the one the one that came out on top is what we have now, and it's still here today, and it still has a lot of power, and um, you know, it essentially took over for, for the entire time of the great apostasy, uh, it sat uh, in the temple of God, so to speak. Because if there hadn't been a rebellion, if um, there hadn't been an apostasy, um, then most people, there were many, many good people that lived through the great apostasy, but uh, because of the actions of those initial people that rebelled, uh, the church was lost and the truth was lost, at least the, the most important parts, um, or, you know, the important things like uh, the priesthood and authority. So those people that should have been part of the quote unquote temple of God, uh, you know, they thought that they were the body of Christ and, and in spirit, I think that they were, but you had this organization that came out on top that was sitting in a place that it really shouldn't have. Um, had things gone correctly, the way that it should have gone, uh, if there had not been a rebellion against the apostles and the leaders of the church. So, anyway, you, you see the problem here. You see the problem here. We, as Latter-day Saints, we have this concept 
that the church got lost very shortly after the time of Christ's uh, crucifixion. It did not last very long at all. And this is where we see Antichrist taking over, sitting on the throne of God, acting as though they are God, you know, proclaiming their philosophies, whatever. So let, let's continue on. Um, uh, so <clears throat> remember, history is long, right? The time from the time of Christ until now is a very long time. Now, a key idea with one of these things, with the 70 weeks of Daniel, which we're going to talk about, is that the temple and Jerusalem itself got destroyed. Okay? And I'm going to show you how that ties in, because when you look at the the people that are putting together timelines of the 70th, the 70th week of Daniel, okay, this has to do with, um, well, I guess we'll just do it now. Okay, so first, okay, geez, how am I going to do this? Let's just go here. Okay, so let's see. Daniel is talking to the angel Gabriel. It says here, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now coming forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, Daniel, this was during the Babylonian captivity, right? So, the temple had been destroyed. Many of the Jews had been taken into exile, at least the ones that were more wealthy or of use to the Babylonian Empire. And so, um, this has to do with the return, okay? So, Gabriel, the angel, says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make re reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in, in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Okay, so he's talking here about Israel being permitted to go back, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple in preparation for the Messiah, the most holy. Right? This is talking about Christ first coming. And then moving on. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. <clears throat> this is not referring to the latter days. This is talking about the time between the Babylonian exile, and when Christ comes the first time, okay? And when we're talking about weeks, in case you're new or you, have, you don't know what this idea is talking about, um, the weeks, it's not literal weeks. These are essentially, we, we don't even really know necessarily if this is being um, compared to years because the, the prevailing opinion is that uh, the weeks being talked about here is like a week is seven years. Okay, so weeks of years. So, well, if that's the case, what we're talking about here is 62 weeks plus seven weeks, which is 69. And then later it talks about a seventh week. Okay, so altogether it's 490 years. If, if these are if these are indeed years, and I, I do think that that's the case. Um, okay, so let's look at this timeline. This is an Old Testament timeline. This is on the church website. You have Adam over here. You scroll over. You know, here in the middle we have Noah and his three sons, and then Abraham, and then after that um, the captivity uh, in Egypt. And then after that, united Israel. And then after that, the northern kingdom being destroyed. And then after that, the southern kingdom being taken uh, captive. And then later, allowed to go back. Because the Persians take, took over and let them go back to Jerusalem. And that's when this starts. So the 60 weeks, or the 69 weeks, go from this period right here. If you can see on the screen, okay, where it says Persia right here. It goes from here all the way till over here when uh, Christ comes. Those are the 69 weeks, okay? So, let's go back to Daniel. Let's see. Um, okay. 
And after three score in two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, okay, sorry. So, let's see. Going forth the command, um, okay, shall be seven weeks. Okay, so there's the, the first seven weeks, and then after that is the 62 weeks. Okay, so after these 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Okay, so Christ, right, his life was cut short. He was killed. He was crucified, but he didn't do it for himself. He did it for everybody else, right? Okay, and the people of the prince that shall come <clears throat> shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, so at the time of Christ, the the uh, 69 weeks have already gone by. So you have another seven years after Christ, okay? The last week. Now, for some reason, <clears throat> what people do, both within our church, um, which I think they draw inspiration from people outside of our church, they take this last week, the 70th week, and instead of logically just continuing from the 69 weeks, um, they break it off and then bring it all the way to now. Some think that we're currently in the 70th week. Um, I, I do not accept, I, I reject this idea because, um, well, what we're reading here, okay? So the 70th week, okay? Let's go back to the scripture. And it says, um, so after the 69 weeks, um, the people the, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Of course, that's referring to Jerusalem and the sanctuary is the temple. And who did that? Yes, the Roman Empire. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, this part right here is a little ambiguous because you don't know if it's talking about the Messiah. Is that the he? Or is it talking about the uh, prince right here? Now, this is where you get another Antichrist um, assumption. Um, other churches will be like, okay, this is the 70th week. This is during our time. And you have... Um, this Antichrist that confirms the covenant with many for one week. So people are looking right now all over the place at different candidates, like, um, you know, different political leaders or businessmen or anyone that they think could fit the bill of uh, Antichrist. Okay. But let's go back here. Um, I would argue, and with the material, material that we're going to go over, that this is simply talking about the Roman Empire when it destroyed Jerusalem and, um, and the temple, right? So, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So this is the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Yeah, because the temple and the Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. So there's no more temple sacrifice going on. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even un until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We know that the destruction of Jerusalem is referred to as the abomination of desolation. Okay, and we're using that language right here. So when we go over here to this timeline, uh, this is just like a generic uh, timeline of world history starting with uh, 1 AD. So in the year 70, so remember, Christ, he was uh, killed here approximately um, 30 to 33 AD, right? And so um, after that time, you have, um, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um, essentially what you have immediately afterwards, and I think that this is what this is talking about. You have the destruction of Jerusalem right here, 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the temple is destroyed. Now, again, we don't know if it's exactly uh, one year or if it's seven years per week, um, there's a thing here that we're, that we're going to read in a little bit that says that it could be different. 
But it seems like this right here might be what it's talking about when it's talking about the destruction of um, the sanctuary and the ceasing of the oblations and all that stuff, right? So there you go. You have the 70 weeks of Daniel, and then you go down through time, you know, and that was the supposed Antichrist. Uh, it looks like it's right here. It doesn't have anything to do with the last days. And then you come all the way through here. You know, we're going through the great apostasy. It's a really, really, really long time. Really, 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 really long time. A lot of things happen during this time. And then the church is restored. Um, the process of which starts in 1820. But then it's uh, officially established in 1830. Okay. So, <clears throat> so anyway, keep that in mind. Um, let's go here. Okay, so this is the uh, student manual for Old Testament on the church website. Gabriel's explanation of the 70 weeks. Though the, though the time periods mentioned are difficult to identify, the context and several phrases in the passage indicate that the passage has to do with the period in which the salvation of Daniel's people is to be accomplished. Daniel 9.24 is undoubtedly a reference to the coming of Christ, the first time, and his atonement, by which forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God through repentance would be made possible. By completing the mission his father sent him to accomplish, Christ fulfilled the law and the words of the prophets concerning his coming, and thus he, quote-unquote, seal up, make sure the vision and prophecy. In verse 24. Verse 25 refers to the time between the return of the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah. Verse 26 makes reference to the Messiah being cut off, but not for himself, which seems to be an allusion to his crucifixion. The rest of the chapter describes the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and parallels very closely the message of Matthew 24, 15 and Joseph Smith's inspired revision of that verse. The reference to confirming the covenant for one week, however, has not been satisfactorily explained and may make problematic the explanation given above. So, um, but you can see how that's probably what's going on. It's not... It, with no explanation, taking the 70th week and then bringing it 2,000 years into the future to be completed by an Antichrist. No, it just, <laughs> there were Antichrists at the time after Christ's death. Um, not only Antichrists that essentially infiltrated the church and um, tried to take over and create their own factions, but you also had the Roman Empire that was an incredible force and, uh, in the beginning, they persecuted um, the Jews and the Christians, and they destroyed the temple and the city. So, anyway, um, okay, where are we at now? Now, let's talk about what happened to Christ's church. Okay, this is, what is it? <laughs> February 2005, New Era. What happened to Christ's church? Following the Savior's death, the apostles spread the gospel and the church grew quickly throughout the Roman Empire. But almost immediately after the ascension of the Savior, the apostles began to be persecuted. James, the brother of John, and one of the original twelve apostles was killed by Herod. See Acts 12, 1-2. Peter and Paul were also killed during New Testament times. We don't have records of the deaths of all the apostles, but we do know that all but John the all but John the Beloved died, and after a time ceased to be replaced. The keys and authority of the holy priesthood were lost with the deaths of the church leaders. Without this authority, no new revelation, doctrine, or scripture could come. All right. Here's another timeline. Timeline here. Um, so you see down here. These are the approximate years. In the year 64, Jewish war commences uh, with Rome, and then the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in 65, and then in the year 70, siege and capture of Jerusalem, and then after that, 95, persecution of Christians by uh, Domitian, or Domitian, I'm not sure how you, how you pronounce that. Now, um, again, so it's not, it's not just, you know, 2 Thess Thessalonians 2 and Daniel that 
people get this Antichrist idea from. Um, it's also, well, it, okay, it's also in Daniel 7. So here it says, <clears throat> After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is talking about the Roman Empire, okay? And uh, I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, before the fourth beast, he describes several other beasts. So, and I'll just read it here. This is also in the Old Testament student manual. Uh, first, so the first beast, uh, which was like a lion with eagle's wings, represented the Babylonian kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. The second beast represented the Midian Persian Empire. The third, so we're talking about the superpowers of the ancient world and, and all the way till today. The third kingdom corresponded to the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, also known as the Macedonian Empire. And then the fourth beast was not likened to an animal. It was, however, very strong and dreadful and broke into pieces the remains of the former kingdoms. It represented the Roman Empire and the forces of evil that were manifest through the empire. The ten horns are the kingdoms into which the, the Roman Empire was afterwards divided. They are similar to the ten toes of the great image described in Daniel 2. So, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, and it corresponds with these beasts. These beasts are just another way of looking at the same thing. The, the head of the statue is the, is the Babylonian Empire, and, and then it just goes on down the line. Okay, so you have the toes of the statue, or the horns of the fourth beast, the same thing. And then after here, after that it says, though each of these beasts may be said to represent the worldly kingdoms mentioned, the representation probably was not just their political dominion, but also of the evils upheld and perpetrated upon the world by their rule. Okay, <clears throat> going back to Daniel 7, 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Okay, so now we have a 11th horn, and it's little. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, and then if you go on down to 20, it says, And the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom the three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, those whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Uh, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the, this kingdom are ten kings, uh, which you could also say kingdoms, uh, that shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings, or kingdoms. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the times and laws, that they shall be given into his hand, until a time and times and dividing of a time. So here's one of the three and a half year periods that um, are referred to. Now, we've already done <clears throat> a couple of videos talking about what three and a half means, and to a Jewish person, that's a time when evil is allowed to rule. It's not talking about a quantitative three and a half years or three and a half anything. It, it's a symbolic way of saying when evil has its way, is allowed to have its way, or apostasy. Okay, we come back over here to the student manual. The vision should not be thought of as wholly political either, particularly in view of the little horn. This symbol cannot be positively identified with any specific individual or kingdom of the world, but it seems to be similar to the beast rising out of the sea that John saw in Revelation, which also made war with the saints, as did this form. The little horn represents a notable antichrist power that was to be raised up after the time of the Roman Empire. And it was said, or, and it was to be different from the other ten kingdoms 
mentioned after the Roman kingdom. Daniel said that this horn would have power to make war with and hinder the saints until the time of Christ's second coming. I'm, I'm going to say it again. Okay, I'm going to say it again. This is my theory. You don't have to accept this. But if the ten, if the ten uh, horns and the ten toes are basically kingdoms that come from the, the, from the remnants of the Roman Empire, then you could easily be like, yeah, the, so you have like these different countries, Italy, uh, France, Spain, Portugal, the United Kingdom, so on and so forth. Okay, 10 kingdoms uh, or 10 horns. Um, so if these are horns, if countries are horns, uh, can you think of a little tiny country that has a mouth and eyes and has all sorts of power? Um, a little a little country that can do that? Um, I can think of one, and it's this right here on the screen. It's this. This is literally a country. This is a, a city-state right here. And it has, through history, wielded a whole lot of power. A whole lot of power. And it still does to this day. Um, it has lots of money. Uh, it influences a lot of people. Let's go back to this timeline right here. So remember, as we go through the years and the centuries, this is a long, long, long freaking time that this little horn has been able to do all sorts of things. And I'm not saying that everything has been bad, but it, not everything has been good either. Um, so we have to take into account that there's more history than just our own time. Not everything happens in our own time. When you think about the last days, a lot of people tend to think of like, oh, let's go all the way over here. Okay, we're in the, we're in the, you know, uh, we're in the uh, <laughs> 21st century. Now we're in the last days. Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. If we look at the seals in the book of Revelation, we know that the Earth's temporal existence is 7,000 years, right? And we know from modern Revelation, from DNC 77, that these seals represent 1,000 year periods of Earth's history. That's what these are. So, the first four go up until the time of Christ, okay? And then these two, number five and number six, uh, go up until now, from the time of Christ until now. So this is a lot of time before Christ. It's a lot. You have 4,000 years right here uh, before Christ, and then 2,000 years afterwards. These are the last days. It encompasses the entire era. It, it, it encompasses this entire time, you know, especially the sixth seal, and then even more, the first part of the seventh seal. But, um, you know, these are included in the last days, too. A, a lot of times I feel like uh, there's members of the church that don't, they don't realize that from the time of Joseph Smith until now, so many things have happened that would be classified as uh events of the last days. Think about World War One, World War II. That's part of the last days. It's happened. And not everything has to happen to us right now in 2022. It's been happening since Joseph Smith. And there's been things happening since the time of Christ. These are the last days. It's not just a couple decades or a few, a handful of years. It's this entire era that we're in right now. And uh, now we are kind of like at the peak of it, so, um, you know, we can look at it that way. But the entire dispensation, uh, and then even the centuries before, uh, all the way back until Christ, are the last days. So, um, let's see, what the heck were we even, I lost my train of thought. I think we were still over here. Oh yeah, um, okay. The little horn represented a note. Think about what I said about this little this little horn right here. What what I think is a little horn, and there could be others. Okay, there could be others. I know. I'm not saying that this is the interpretation. It just fits very nicely. It fits really nicely given the fact that it is considered a country and it is tiny. And um, in fact, it's embedded 
with within another country. I, I have to wonder if maybe this is one of the horns that got one of the three horns that got plucked up uh, by the the little horn. But anyway, I don't know. Um, okay, let's go back here. Let's read more about the little horn. Um, the little horn represented a notable antichrist power. Uh, that was to be raised up after the time of the Roman Empire, and it was to be different from the other ten kingdoms mentioned after the Roman Kingdom. Yeah, it's different because it's not like an actual kingdom, if my theory is right. Uh, it's not. It's different. And guys, do not forget how much power it wielded from the time of Christ. Um, it, now, it seems to have like lost power, but I'm not so sure about that. There are secret combinations. Um, and I'm not talking about the good people of, of that church. I'm just talking about the power structure. Okay. Anyway, and it was to be different from the other ten kingdoms mentioned after the, the Roman kingdom. Daniel said that this horn would have power to make war with and hinder the saints until the time of Christ's second coming. Concerning this great evil power and the beast from which it arose... Sidney B. Sperry said, quote, and this is the best. I love this. May I suggest that the last beast which Daniel saw, which was so terrible, and which had a mouth speaking great things, in none other thing in none other than is none other than the great and abominable church of our modern scriptures. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. I think that's why the Book of Mormon talks about that so much. I think that that is the little horn. Uh, now we know that the definition, okay, the the definition of the great and abominable church is any church that doesn't belong to the church, that's not the church of God, right? And um, there, there's a lot that could probably be said about that, but I'm not going to go into all that. Anyway, let me make my point clear. Keep in mind that Daniel saw that the beast was slain and its body destroyed, and it was given to be burned with fire. In a revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith concerning the destructive forces to be unleashed prior to the second, the second advent, the Lord explains, quote, This evil power is doubtless the same one spoke of in the 29th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and testified to by Ezekiel the prophet. Um, the Book of Mormon also speaks at length concerning this evil force in the world <coughs> that shall meet destruction. Notice a few of the words of Nephi. May I emphasize that even, even if the great and abominable church is correctly identified as the power which is represented by Daniel's great beast, we do not at present fully comprehend the ramifications of it or the range of dominion it will have prior to its destruction. Now, you guys, there are secret combinations. They exist. They, they're in full power right now. And I do believe that wherever you can find power, wherever you find money and power, uh, you're also going to find secret combinations. That's why I believe this, and this is based on many, many, many other things that I've seen and studied, but I'm not going to get into that because I'm not going to try and push this point. You believe whatever you want to believe. We do know that there is a great and abominable church, um, and, and then let's just go with the, the definition that the brethren have given us, okay? But there are secret combinations. They're doing horrible things throughout the entire world. Uh, they always have. There's always been secret combinations. Ever since the day of Cain, Cain and Abel, there's always been secret combinations. Doing things in the background. Having a public face, right? A good public face usually, but doing really bad stuff in the background. Uh, usually to maintain their power and grow their power and their control. So, uh, anyway... Uh, and then here in, um, Revelation, okay, L look at what it says in the chapter heading. John sees the imminent apostasy of the church. This is another chapter, another thing that uh, other Christians don't understand. They read this, uh, they think that this is something that's happening now, that this has to do with the rapture of the church, but it's not. He's, he's talking about what's about to happen in his own time and how the church is going to flee into the wilderness to a place that God has prepared, and then it's going to come back. And that's why in Doctrine and Covenants, you always you hear the phrase a lot, 
the church coming out of obscurity or coming out of the wilderness. It, it's tying back into the book of Revelation in the language that's being used here. The woman that f fled w is the church and the child is the kingdom of God, the political kingdom that should have continued had everything gone right. But it's coming back in the last days. The church is here and then the kingdom itself is going to be implemented when uh, the Savior comes and establishes it. And it, and it seems like it's going to start at Adam and Ayaman. So anyway, here's a chapter where it's talking about a length of time, uh, 1,203 score days, which is 1,260. Uh, I've, I've shown this a billion times, but you'll notice that in the Joseph Smith version, uh, the Joseph Smith translation, um, days is changed to years. And it makes sense because the apostasy, we know that three and a half represents a time when evil, um, you know, has control, has dominion, in a, a time of apostasy. We know that three and a half represents that. And so this apostasy would not be um, for, for the length of just days, right? Uh, it's going to be, in, it was going to be for the length of years, for about 2,000 years, for a really long time. So I really do think that this is uh, inspired. I know it's inspired. So um, I think that might be everything I wanted to cover. Um, no, I wanted to read about Thessalonians. So again, this is the one where it says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come, meaning the second coming is not going to come, except there be a falling away first, which is talking about the great, the great apostasy, and that man of sin be revealed, uh, which is talking about Satan, and, and we'll read that in just a minute. It's not, this is not a singular antichrist. This is not what that's talking about. I, it is, I, I, I hope that I can persuade you that there, we should not be looking for an antichrist to appear before Christ comes. Okay, it's not life or death. It's not um, a matter of your testimony, but it, it it puts you in a state where you're like, oh no, we still got time. Uh, you know, we haven't even seen this yet, and I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Who who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Or that is worship, so that he is he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Uh, and if you if you tend to you know believe my my theory here about this little guy right here, uh, that certainly that certainly is the case. Um, it would seem. Here, let's go to a three, the a three six. Whoa, that is not what I wanted to to go to. Um, Let's go to this one. There it is. Let's see. Anyway, um, let's go back here. Second Thessalonians. Uh, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Yeah, because there's already people trying to take parts of the church away with them and start their own uh, church, essentially. Um, only he who knoweth letteth will let. Well, okay. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, uh, the second coming. Because we know that uh, false things, powers, countries, power structures, they're all going to go away with the brightness of his coming. The great and spacious building, right? Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lyings and wonders, or lying in wonders. And for this cause, for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And um, the world has basically been under delusion. Uh, I mean, that's just part of mortality. When when you don't have the truth in your life, that obviously you're living a delusional life when you don't have the truth. Okay, if we look at the um, New Testament study manual, okay, if, if we learn about the purpose, the purpose of this epistle, 
that gives us a big hint as to what we're actually reading. Instead of reading this and being like, oh, this is the man of sin that is going to happen in the last days. Uh, we need to wait for this Antichrist to be revealed. No, no. Look what it says here. In his second epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote words of counsel and clarification to members of the church who misunderstood certain aspects of the second coming of Jesus Christ. His teachings help modern readers understand the nature of the apostasy, the apostasy, and how to prepare appropriately for the Lord's return. Okay, now when we come down here, um, it says, Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, suggest that some of the believers in Paul's days, in Paul's day were alarmed or fearful that the Lord's second coming had already taken place. Their concerns may have resulted from doctrinal misunderstanding, or they may have been deceived by false teachings in a forged letter purportedly written by Paul. Paul cautioned the saints uh, not to embrace information that church leaders had not previously taught. And that's... I feel like that's something that's going on right now because no church leader has ever taught this right here or this. Neither one of these things have been taught by any church leader. Show me a time that a church leader has talked about a mid-trib um, rapture or um, seven-year tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week coming all the way to 2,000 years later to be part of this seven-year tribute. You're not going to find it. You're not. Um, if there was one, I would have found it by now. I promise you. It, okay, so anyway, but there, there's more. Let's continue on. Um, in order to, to calm the saints concern that the Lord had, had already returned, Okay, sorry. In order to calm the saints' concern that the Lord had already returned, Paul explained that before the second coming, there would be a falling away first. And we know that that's the apostasy, the great apostasy. Falling away is a translation of the Greek word apostasia, a word that is closer in meaning to rebellion or mutiny. Okay, we already read this in the BYU thing. Paul was, be was therefore speaking of an intentional fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ rather than a gradual movement away from it. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi's vision of the, f of the future taught him that the house of Israel joined with those in the great and spacious building to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Apostasy off is often not simply a passive letting go of truth, but an act of rebellion that originates within the covenant community. That's no good. President James E. Faust uh, spoke about the apostasy, or spoke about how the apostasy was clearly foretold by New Testament apostles. Quote, some of the early apostles knew that an apostasy would occur before the second coming. Don't get confused and think that this is talking about our days. It's talking about their days. They knew that in their time, uh, immediately after their time, that this apostasy was going to happen. I don't know why, but I've seen some members of the church saying that they think that there's going to be an apostasy now and that that has to happen before Christ comes. I have never seen that anywhere. I don't know where that idea comes from. Um, if it's if it's coming from 2 Thessalonians, that is not at all what that's talking about. They're talking about the original great apostasy. I'm not aware of any sort of apostasy that's supposed to happen uh, now in our day. So I, I don't think that that's correct. All right. To the Thessalonians, Paul wrote concerning this event, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, uh, because it's going to be 2,000 years in the future, except there come a falling away first, a great apostasy during that time. Uh, the rapid process of apostasy commenced during the apostles' lifetimes. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, quote, New Testament epistles clearly indicate that serious and widespread apostasy, not just sporadic dissent, began soon. James decried wars and fightings among the church. Paul lamented divisions in the church and how grievous wolves would not spare the flock. He knew an apostasy was coming and wrote to the Thessalonians that Jesus' second coming would not occur except there be a falling away first further advising that iniquity doth already work right now at the time that he's writing that. Near the end, Paul acknowledged how 
<clears throat> Paul acknowledged how very extensive the falling away was. All they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Okay, the man of sin in the son of perdition. Okay, now we're talking about that term itself. In addition to the falling away that would take place, Paul explained that the quote, man of sin or son of perdition would be revealed prior to the Lord's second coming. The word perdition is derived from the Latin uh, perditonium, meaning ruin or destruction. And it is, a, it is a title given to Lucifer when he was cast out of God's presence during the premortal life. All those who rebelled with Satan against God during the premortal existence became the sons of perdition when they were cast out of God's presence. Paul also described the man of sin, one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is God. The Joseph Smith translation makes clear that in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, 7 through 9, Paul re was referring to Satan. Oh, so if we look at Joseph Smith translations, then that helps us understand the scriptures better, right? And here they are right here in the footnotes. Um, let's see. Or be troubled by letter, except ye receive it from us, neither by spirit nor by word. Joseph Smith, and for there to become a fall away first. I'm not sure where he's talking about. Um, oh, it's probably right here. Yeah, it's in the in, in the appendix. Let's read it. <clears throat> okay, Joseph Smith translation, Second Thessalonians chapter two, seven through nine. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he it is who now worketh, and Christ suffereth him to work, or allows him to work, until the time is fulfilled that he shall be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Yea, the Lord, even Jesus, whose coming is not until after there cometh a falling away, by the working of Satan, with the power and signs and lying wonders. Satan. That's who it's talking about. It is not talking about um, a man of sin, uh, an antichrist that... We, we don't know about yet. He's going to put micro trips in our brains and in our hands. And he's going to sit in the third temple in Jerusalem. And everyone's going to have to worship his image. You guys, that is all evangelical and other Christian denominations trying their best to understand the scriptures without the concept of a great apostasy. You can see how they might arrive at this conclusion. Without the knowledge of a great apostasy, you would have no idea what chapter 12 of Revelation means. You, you would have no idea. You would have no idea. You would think that this is stuff that has to happen. Here, when it's talking about the dragon um, casting a third of the stars down with his tail, we understand that to mean the pre-mortal life, the, the pre-existence. But they think that that's something that has to still happen. They think that it has nothing to do with that. They don't have the concept of pre-existence. Uh, so they're like, okay, so when we see some kind of dragon figure uh, doing something with the stars or maybe with like satellites or something like that, then we know that this scripture is fulfilled. <laughs> right? Um, it's just, we got to be careful. We cannot go looking at their interpretations before, before we understand our own first. And, and I, I would I would say that that's where we should. I think it's okay to look at what other people are saying, but you have to be very, 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 very cautious because there are f incredibly basic fundamental differences uh, between their beliefs and ours when it comes to topics like this, among many others. So, um, okay, so let's go back here. I think there might be more. Uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and, oh, we, we already read this. Um, with the restoration of the gospel in modern scriptures, an accurate understanding of the adversity of the adversary has been restored. In 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 7, Paul said that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In the New Testament, the word mystery refers to those things which are uh, that were hidden, but have that have been or will be revealed. 
The hidden efforts of Satan to oppose and tear down the church of God, therefore, will be exposed by God's servants. And that's what's going on right now with the restoration. We know, we know, we know that there has been an apostasy. Christianity does not know that. They think that everything's been fine. Uh, we're talking about the church age. No, no, no. There was an apostasy, and um, it was because of Satan. And Satan has been doing a lot with the quote-unquote church uh, from that time until now. It's been revealed. The, the Antichrist, Satan, has been revealed. And we know how much power he's had. Uh, I don't, and I don't think it's just been spiritual power. I think that, uh, I mean, Doctrine and Covenants talks about how he can appear as an angel of light to people. And there's a way to test to see if you're actually talking with an angel or um, with a fallen, you know, a, a follower of Satan because they don't have a body. So <clears throat> um, I think that they have more than just spiritual power on this earth. They're the ones that administer secret combinations. When, when Satan came to Christ during his fast in the wilderness, and he said that, I'll give you these kingdoms, I think that he really could, in the sense that he could have, if if he was successful at tricking Christ or whatever, he could have initiated Christ into the, the secret combinations and made him uh, a person of power and prestige. You know, he was trying to tempt Christ to give him his worldly uh, power, you know. Um, I think he really does, in many senses, run a lot of things in this world. Um, but anyway, that, that's kind of going beyond the scope of my channel. But anyway, so I hope that makes sense. The, the, to, to wrap this up, okay, the reason why I think that we get confused as Latter-day Saints is we don't realize... Um, we don't realize the relationship of the great apostasy to the quote-unquote antichrists of the day, the days of John, the revelator, the people that were already dividing the church, creating factions, and then the great and abominable church that came along, uh, which essentially solidified its power. And um, since that time, it, just everything has pretty much been lost. Uh, it, it required a great restoration in the last days to bring everything back and get things back on track. Um, so these Christians that are looking forward to an Antichrist, uh, they don't understand the concept of the great apostasy. If they did, then they might be like, oh, okay, so this is actually just talking about John's own day when there was the falling away and the rebellion and the Antichrist, and, and Satan, ready to destroy the church. Because that's what it talks about in Revelation 12. It talks about the dragon who's ready to eat up the child as soon as he's born. He, he was there ready to destroy everything, and he did destroy everything. Uh, he didn't destroy the church itself. The church fled, but he uh, took over what was going on on Earth. And um, anyway... Uh, I think that's all I have to say about this one. I think we pretty much covered everything. So, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully, this kind of um, made things a little bit clearer. Okay? And, and I really don't think that we should be looking for an Antichrist um, in order to know that Christ is coming. I've never heard any church authority ever, 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 any church leader ever talk about it in, in that kind of way. Other than what we've talked about today, many antichrists, there are many, but I don't think that we should be looking for a sign of an antichrist and then be like, oh, okay, now we know it's, now we know it's close. Okay, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, uh, put your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share this, especially with anyone that has this idea, they're waiting for an antichrist to come on the scene uh, before they feel like... Uh, are getting close and I'll talk to you guys later.